Hello and welcome to the History of Diving Museum um, Immerse Yourself presentation. We want to thank you for joining us on the third Wednesday of every month. I have some attendees that are sitting in the research library and they're going to be participating. We also have um, all of our Zoom participants, so thank you. And for those of you that are going to be eventually watching this on our YouTube channel, um, be sure to uh, send us any kind of questions and we'll reach out to Scott and get those answered for you. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the History of Diving Museum, we're located at mile marker 83 in the beautiful Florida Keys. Right now we have 14 core exhibits plus aquanauts to astronauts, which will be open through the end of um, 2023. If you're in town and you want to volunteer, we've got a lot of different projects going on. So please reach out to director at divingmuseum.org for more information. To let you know, next month, we are going to be having Tim Thomas. He is a fisheries historian from the Monterey Bay um, area. And he's gonna be talking to us about the Japanese abalone divers who came over and um, really launched that industry in the Monterey Bay area. So that's what we have going on. Tonight, we have Scott Cassell. He is a world-renowned explorer, um, humanitarian, researcher, filmmaker, counterterrorism operative, um, an all-around great guy also sporting a wonderful history of diving music shirt. Thank you for modeling, Scott. <laughs> um, and Scott's gonna be walking us through the background on some submersible operations, some of the things that he's uh, had, bringing us up to uh, where we are today, and then how submersible operations are gonna be used in the future for potential lionfish research, scientific research, and, and other uh, missions that he's got up his sleeve. So thank you for joining us, Scott. We appreciate, uh, we would like to have you on site like we originally planned to be killing lionfish this time of year, but we are glad that you're uh, joining us from uh, Colorado, or California. <laughs> Colorado, um, California, it's one of the C words, it doesn't matter, so. Yeah. <laughs> So I will be turning this over to you. Julia will be monitoring our chats. If you have any questions, let us know where you're from, how many people are watching with you. And then as Scott does his presentation, go ahead and put your questions in there. And at the end, um, we will be moderating. Oh, and now I see Sharky. All right, Sharky, we want to thank our sponsors tonight. Sharky is here on site. Um, Sharky Alexander is on our board. He and his lovely wife, Julie, are in the research library. Sharky's business, Triton Surface Supplied Diving, his Mark V diving experience and helmet diving, which takes place, uh, what, up at Jules Undersea Lodge? Yep. Yep. So, we're, we're up with Neon Koblik. So thank you for being our board member. Thank you for being a sponsor and um, a fellow explorer like uh, Scott. Yep, I think we met one time in New York. I'm not real sure. You look very familiar. You look familiar to me too. So I was thinking that earlier, but uh, yeah, let me put my eyes back in. You know, oh yeah. yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Explorers know each other. So yes, we do. Small All community, right. actually. So, so uh, <laughs> thank you, Sharky, and we're going to hand it over to Scott, and then we'll bring our sponsors back at the end as well. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. Well. Lisa, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's, it's always fun to talk to you and to talk to, uh, talk to other people that are interested in the oceans. I've always just, you know, I couldn't be amongst uh, better people, in my opinion. So the, the oceans are, you know, just so magnificent. It's, uh, it's an easy draw, but it's always fun to meet people that are doing uh, work around the ocean because as similar as we all are, we're also so different. So it's, uh, it's always just a pleasure. So thank you for having me. Um, you're right. I should be there in Florida doing the lionfish culling with the submarine and, and, uh, hopefully we'll be again soon. But, uh, in the meantime, I'm going to bring you up to speed. I originally was going to talk about just, uh, our little submarine and, you know, it's a shallow water sub, but she's a workhorse, got thousands of dives on her and done, dove in se uh, seven different countries. But, uh, the bottom line 
is that we've dedicated her to using her for culling lionfish. Um, but since I've seen you last, we've had an event uh, in the submersible community that is very close to home with the uh, Ocean Gate problem. And uh, I actually worked with the Ocean Gate team on two different programs. One of them was an expedition that I was heading. And I'm gonna bring you guys a little up to date on what actually happened and uh, a little bit about uh, the, the culture that was there that led to the problem. So, so anyway, I like talking to fellow subhumans, which is why I always label things like that. That is a compliment to me, by the way, uh, from me. So talk about the Ocean Gate disaster and hunting lionfish using submarines, something I think everybody should have. Everybody needs a submarine in their garage and everybody needs to use them to uh, have fun hunting lionfish because they're delicious, they're invasive, and uh, you can actually earn a living doing it, which is something I, I'm thinking about very seriously. Um, I've got 15,000 plus hours underwater, a little over 3,000 dives and subs. I've piloted five different submersibles in all three categories, research, film, and tourism. So basically anybody that'll give me the opportunity to pilot a sub, I'll say yes, thank you and do it. <laughs> so that's uh, probably me in my office for the most part. That's Antipodes. We're going to talk about here in just a little bit. But, uh, it's just a beautiful machine. A lot of people get inside of her and we can operate all the way down to nearly a thousand feet, 969 feet. And the nice thing about Antipodes is that she's American Bureau of Shipping Standards classed. And she was made in the 70s by uh, the Perry boats uh, down in Florida, who make some of the finest submarines in the world and they have for a long time. They were made for the oil industry. So she's a workhorse sub that's been transitioned into being a tourism sub. And she's absolutely amazing. So one of my favorites I ever do. That's my sub, one of them. It, it's uh, um, before she was uh, officially transitioned into being the, uh, the Great White which is uh, my personal sub you'll hear about, but uh, that's one of her set of clothes. And then we transition her to looking different. And uh, yes, subs can fly if you have a crane, but uh, she's just a nice little workhorse sub. And we'll talk a little bit about her transitions, but I've also piloted the Sea Pearls, which are made by Seamage and Hydrospace. And uh, in my opinion, some of the finest subs that have ever been built because they're very easy to inspect, very easy to, to problem solve anything with the sub. And they're very kind uh, to the sub pilots. They're very predictable and just a wonderful, big, honestly, just durable sub. And you don't even need a support boat. Those pontoons underneath the, uh, the main hull of the sub can lift her up so high. She operates like a little pontoon boat on the water and she's very easy to tow over long distances. Um, and uh, these particular subs, this, this sub right here will go to 500 feet, but the one prior to that, the blue one is a 1500 foot model. There's a 3000 foot model. Um, and the same people, my friends there, they taught me how to dive submarines about 35 years ago. And um, they uh, now build other subs called the Aurora series, which in my opinion are the most beautiful subs ever built, but they're also some of the most well-made. Um, Triton builds some beautiful subs in Florida that are absolutely incredible with their depth, depth capabilities. And uh, I've been able to go up and touch one and look at it and slobber all over it. But uh, ultimately, I'm, I go right back to the sea imagine because that's my, you know, that's where I, uh, I trained and, and I'm very, very in love with the machine. So every opportunity that the owner, Will Conan and Charles uh, Conan, when they bring me into the fold, I'm just back home. So they're just great machines. And I've done a lot of explorations with sea mobiles. Um, this is actually uh, diving inside uh, Fallen Leaf Lake near Lake Tahoe to a depth of about 350 feet, uh, looking at ancient trees. This particular tree is 4,000 years old. We actually set up a drill system on the front of the sub and did a core sample and uh, broke it out and delivered four core samples up to the, uh, uh, oh, I forget, he's a, he's a paleobotanist, I guess they call him. And they took it to the University of Reno and did uh, core sampling analysis with carbon dating. And the darn trees are between 2,000 and 4,200 years old whole bunch of trees, a whole forest of 88 trees. It's really fun to pilot a submarine through a forest underwater. It's pretty cool. So just a great machine. Also dove on the earthquake fault in uh, Lake Tahoe down to a depth of about 400 feet and uh, really found some interesting stuff, including a new species of life, a protist that uh, lives on hydrothermal vents on that earthquake fault. So even in Lake Tahoe, there's chemosynthetic organisms. Um, 
So it's really interesting. You never know where you'll find what life. Uh, that's one of the wonders about being a sub, but I've also piloted some hot rods. This is a, this is a Cronus, it's a wet sub. And this sub will kill you. Uh, <laughs> you pilot it as a uh, uh, diver and it is six knots underwater, which is, I don't know, I think the equivalent is like 300 miles an hour under, uh, in the air for a motorcycle. So that, you know, you, you, you don't want to poke your head above the windscreen. It'll rip your mask right off, which is why most of the time I dove a helmet just for that one reason. But it's a magnificent machine. And I even set a world record with that one. Uh, there's another sub I piloted. That's um, um, a wet sub that I built that uh, primarily used for removing nets. It's a little pickup truck, but it also goes six knots. And uh, I can go, I don't know, about seven miles uh, total time, dive time. And um, I used it to find lost ghost gear and I'd park this up on the bottom. I'd umbilical swim out with two welders bottles full of air um, with a 50 foot umbilical. And I'd cut the, uh, the nets free best I could and then stuff them in the back like a little open cell and then try to take them back. And uh, she was just a fun machine. I don't have it anymore. And I'm seriously thinking about building another one. <laughs> So uh, it's kind of like flying a fighter aircraft underwater. It's a lot of fun. So you can see the power of the machine there. That's, uh, I had, uh, I went underneath a float um, at full speed and it was kicking up like an orca, a, a surface wake. And, and uh, the people on the float were actually rocked pretty good. By the sub going. I had no idea I made that big of a wake, but it was funny. So, but ultimately, you know, I'm a filmmaker. That's all I am. Uh, I just happen to use a submarine or scuba gear and different little strange things to get to my work site. I've done 54 documentaries uh, for a whole bunch of people, uh, but I'm my I'm self-professed squid nerd. I absolutely am nuts about squid. Don't get me started on squid. I'll 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 sit you down until you. I've told you so much about squid, you really want to just leave. Um, but I'm also uh, absolutely in love with sharks. That's me and my other office, that's a 200 pound Humboldt squid. Um, that same squid actually got free a moment after that picture was taken and uh, bit me on the wrist with a man-sized beak. The beak is literally the size of a man's hand and broke my wrist in five places before I could roll out. But you can see I'm wearing chainmail suit, which is why I still have a hand. It couldn't cut my hand off, but it sure broke the bones inside of it. So um, they have 1200 uh, suction cups and each suction cup is lined with cat's claw type teeth. So as they suck onto you, they're also chewing off parts of you. So they're just amazing. And they can take a bite and swallow an orange sized chunk of flesh every three seconds. So they grab onto their prey item and start eating whether it's dead or alive. So you do not wanna go diving with these animals in a Speedo. So that's the business end prior to them showing the beak, it's covered up by the bucal mass drape which is that little uh, Pentagon looking thing around the, uh, the beak. When that folds back, it's a sensory organ that detects blood and other things in the water. And when that folds back, that beak lunges out and it is a sight to behold. So that's a squid on my face, kind of reminiscent of Alien Hugger. I also, I love sharks. Uh, to me, sharks are puppy dogs like Labrador Retriever. And everybody, I'm sure all you guys know uh, Emma, the tiger shark. This is her sister, this is Ruby. And uh, she was kind enough to let me put a 3D camera on her back. So what, you know, we know what it looked like to be swimming around as a tiger shark in 3D. So that was, that was a fun project. But she ended up wanting the camera. She had lunged on me. And uh, so when she did that, I put the camera still rolling inside of her mouth to give her, you know, sharks are like children. They have to put everything in the mouth. You know, they don't have hands. So when she um, got a hold of the um, camera in her mouth, still rolling in 3D, she gummed it around a little bit and then spit it out intact. So uh, I think I'm the first person in history to get 3D inside of a mouth shark. Uh, and she had beautiful teeth. So this is uh, Mexico. I'm actually hand feeding. Uh, that's about a 500 to 700 pound um, bull shark. And I uh, don't recommend anybody do this. Bull sharks are incredibly aggressive and extraordinarily fast. Um, I'm actually feeding them lionfish. Uh, and this was a long time before people were saying, hey, let's try to feed sharks lionfish. I think this was, I don't know, close to 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, I forget. But um, 
the idea was to train bull sharks how to identify lion sh uh, lionfish as uh, as food, as a prey item, and it worked to a point. You know, we're, I'm getting some nice reports that more and more divers um, are seeing bull sharks predating on the on the lionfish, but mostly it's still groupers and moray eels. So, if uh, you know anybody who spearfishes a uh, grouper, ask them to please maybe not spearfish grouper because they're helping with the problem. Maybe you could spear a lionfish instead because uh, grouper are identifying lionfish all the time now as prey. But uh, bull sharks, they're getting warmed up to the idea. So the beautiful thing about hand feeding a bull shark is to see something which very unique in nature. And that is I have a camera on my forehead and a camera on my hand. And I actually filmed the closing speed of a bull shark to entrap a prey item. And the snap was so fast that it cavitated the water making bubbles. I've never seen that before. That was extraordinary. And uh, as you can see my dive kit there, you know, I've been diving for, for 45 years and I just don't wear anything but dual hose regulators to this day. If I don't, I only wear a single hose regulator if there's nothing else available. So I've got six of those regulators they are always kept up perfect and brand new. So I just, uh, I have old, old traits. I just don't adapt, I guess. <laughs> But like I said, I love sharks the way people love dogs. And lemon sharks are the most cuddly, pettable sharks other than nurse sharks on the world. And I just love playing with them and uh, scratching their bellies and grabbing onto them. So I'm, I'm a grabby person. So they're, I'm really happy that they tolerate that. <laughs> so white sharks, they don't tolerate that very well. I've also worked in different cold environments in the Arctic and uh, dove under the Arctic. I've dove under uh, a lot of ice conditions and stuff. It's, I'm always fascinated what lives under the ice. So. But I'm a military guy, I've served a lot of different places. Some of you guys recognize that crazy ass place, the sandbox. And I uh, spent a lot of time also as a flight medic and uh, as, uh, just, you know, serving my country best I can. And after about 33 years of military service, I stopped. And then I later, <laughs> always being a dumb ass and ju jumping back in, I started to be a military contractor and uh, always trying to, you know, put away the bad guys and help the, help the innocent. I've also helped protect rhinos in Africa. That's actually a picture of me on a patrol for poachers. So, but ultimately I'm always filming poachers and trying to get them prosecuted so they leave animals alone. And it always gravitates to me, you know, going back to the ocean. Um, the ocean is, you know, kind of where I live and that's where I work, but it's also my adopted mom. <laughs> so that's me filming uh, Humboldt squid and the Sea Cortez which um, I've got about 2,000 dives with Humboldt squid filming them for lots of different folks. But that brings us to what happened uh, recently with OceanGate. I worked with OceanGate. My nonprofit was Undersea Voyager Project, UVP. And uh, that's my logo up there in the top, obviously, because remember, I'm a squid nerd and I have subs. So, um, but below that is Antipodes. And uh, OceanGate really didn't have a logo at that time. So uh, I took it over and made the mission patch. But... Um, the bottom line is I got a phone call from Stockton Rush and Guillermo Sunline, and they both were asking me, saying, hey, we're getting into the submersible industry. We've bought a sub that you're familiar with, Antipodes, and we'd like you to come out and show us what you know about the sub and maybe refine our program so that we enter into the sub community a little bit quicker. I said, uh, you know, took me two milliseconds to make the decision. Of course, I'll be right up there to Washington to meet you guys. So I went up there and uh, I chatted with them, delightful people, and uh, had a lot of fun looking at uh, the sub and looking at their project. And so we came up with a program that we agreed with, and it was Expedition Catalina. We were supposed to do 60 dives around Catalina Island uh, over a period of uh, two months or one month, excuse me. And uh, we were gonna both use our companies to fundraise for each other. And I was gonna walk away with a whole bunch of money for my nonprofit. And they were gonna have a learning experience of how to actually operate a submersible in a real expedition, which is the experience that they wanted. And I said, I'm happy to do it because I've done it numerous times. It's complicated, but rewarding. So we put together the program and I went to Washington and uh, I started to just go through the sub with a fine tooth comb, taking everything apart and just, just really getting into the sub and looking for everything, testing torque on every nut and bolt and pressure fitting and looking at all the electronics, you know, just breaking out your voltmeter and checking for resistance, everything. 
And I quickly found out a weird thing with Stockton is that you see me, I'm outside the sub pre-diving and evaluating it. And he's inside the sub peering out. And I started to notice the behavior every time I would find something wrong or I was investigating a part of the sub, he would disappear and get out of voice range. And so as I'm done with the outside of the sub, I climbed up the ladder and I climbed on the inside of the sub and he got out and started walking on the outside of the sub. So I noticed that behavior right away and I thought it was kind of strange, but it turns out that every time I would find something wrong with the sub, he modified the original sub and I was correcting all of his modifications and bring it back into standard on the American Bureau of Shipping. So uh, that's kind of, you know, we, we set our relationship on the first day. But what I found was that Antipodes was delivered to him completely operational. She was flawless, like a brand new car, still had that new submarine smell. And I found several problems with it. And every problem that I found was a modification that Stockton had done. The, uh, for instance, the drop weight was obscured. He actually put a series of shackles in front of it to, to add on some additional stuff and to make it tow a little bit better in the water. And you couldn't drop the weight if you were in an emergency. And so I had him change that out. Thruster controllers, he rewired them to use micro switches, you know, new technology. And they were overrated. Uh, they were underrated for the voltage that it required. So they constantly popped and fried. And so I actually had him put back the original uh, thruster switches back in, and which I found out later during the expedition uh, in uh, Catalina. He switched them back and we had problems. Um, but he also, he was even packing the scrubbers incorrectly. He had 16 dives on different subs, including Antipodes before he met me. And out of that, he had one in water, underwater emergency where he had to abort the dive in an emergency situation. And uh, at that time I had about 13,000 hours underwater and I, hadn't, I didn't have one emergency underwater. The difference, I was taught correctly and I really am a stickler on pre-flight and once the American Bureau of Shipping has standardized a sub and passed it, you don't change it, not even to upgrade it with new technology. You only upgrade it with what is new and approved and already tested by the same guys, the American Bureau of Shipping. And so you just don't go off on your own and be cavalier. And I also noticed that his safety checklists that were originally given to him by the previous owners of Antipodes were abbreviated and, and um, much, much shorter. And he left off some critical parts like life support checks. And so I had, uh, I basically used the systems that I used with Seamagine on the safety checklist. And I went through all of those and expanded on them. So they were three times bigger than what he had. So then I you know, went through their launch and recovery techniques in Washington, made sure that they were safe. And you know, just going through everything I can on the sub prior to expedition uh, deployment, so that we didn't have any surprises, something that I'm sure any of you guys would do. And uh, once everything was all set up, then I gave them the green light. But I just want to point out, out of the submarine there, you see those beautiful, you know, approved thrusters, which are powerful and wonderful. And you see those Beerns lightings uh, on the rail on the front of the dome. You can see one of the black uh, lights right there. And if you look right above those, you see those little long rectangles with those silver spots. Those were LED lights that uh, Stockton had invented and made himself and put on the sub and they failed on the very first dive. And uh, they actually caused a short inside the sub that we had to, to bypass in order to continue. So everything he did seemed to have some kind of a little problem with it. That was, that was a foretelling instance. Getting inside the sub, and again, I would give everybody their tasks on what to do. We always split tasks up. If I'm piloting, somebody else is going to be helping me uh, with radio or with sonar uh, or with other scientific equipment. Then I would let them pilot, and then I would transition. Over, so, okay, I'm going to handle ballast for you. I'm going to need navigation. I'm going to do the Blue View uh, sonar check. And so we would always switch up so everybody knew everybody else's job inside the sub in case there's a problem. But always, always, always just, this is what we do in emergencies. Emergency drills, emergency drills, emergency drills. Driving them kind of crazy, but safety first. Because inside of a sub, when you're the sub pilot, everybody else's lives are in your hands and you dare not risk that. So you darn sure better be the best at what you can be before you ever close that hatch and blow ballast. 
And uh, you can see the two white scrubbers in back of me there. They actually were packing those incorrectly, too loosely, and they were inverting them. I mean, it was just silly stuff. So once we had everything set up, I felt comfortable with them. Um, we actually did some dives in Puget Sound, and this was their very first video, and I helped them film it and pilot the sub and help them make it happen. So after those training dives, um, I felt pretty confident about them, and I endorsed their logbook for Guillermo and Stockton that, you know, I signed them off as, uh, as co-pilots on their own sub. And uh, so they felt pretty confident, and, and they were happy about it, but they, they didn't like how much of a stickler I was. And I understand there were lots of murmurs in back rooms about how, how I was always so safety conscious, but, um, you know, I everybody's personalities have little idiosyncrasies. So I let it go, just I wanted to watch them and go. So we go ahead and baggage up the, uh, the Antipodes with, I love the sleeping bag blanket around the, uh, the conning tower at those beautiful blue covers on those 54 inch domes, he hemi-domes. And uh, we packaged her up. So we loaded her up onto a landing craft, the HydroPro, Southern California, and we transferred her all the way across uh, to Catalina Island. And with the only winch on the island that could lift a 9,000 pound submarine, uh, which was a trick to get her right up at, that close. But we got her up, we got her off the, um, uh, onto the water. And of course, first thing I do is I jump inside there and, and go through every single system on the sub, again, the pre-diver, to see if anything was damaged during the shipping process. And she checked out flawlessly. And so at that point, we bring her up to the dock and I'm ready to go. And there's the crack in the support boat in back of us there. And so I was pretty excited, uh, but then I started to notice that they didn't even know how to tie it up on the dock. Um, so I gave them a little crash cord, uh, course on knots and lines. But uh, the sub remained pretty much um, on a mooring float uh, for the whole time that we're supposed to be there. They had a, a floating platform that they would built for it, but uh, the damn thing kept breaking and not working. So once again, trying to reinvent the wheel. So we ended up just putting her on a mooring ball and watching her all night, having watches, you know, somebody sitting on the beach, watching the sub, make sure she doesn't sink. So we had 16 sites planned out on Catalina Island and we had 30 days to do it. And we were all excited. It was the beginning of the trip. Um, and, you know, there we are uh, headed out on the first dive. Um, I'm doing the surface watch on during the tow just a wonderful day we get her all set up and you can tell by the color of the water the first dive was about 300 feet deep and uh really just on our way to doing something really fun together and this was the very first uh film that we did the site was the uh this is famous on the right is the blue sonar on the left is the video This is sweet. Did you get, get it back up to Gerald? Uh, he had the starboard, starboard side. Uh, when we read you cracking, we found the missing part of the hyperbaric chamber. We had to circumnavigate it for a little bit. And, uh, and Sure, 
So is there another piece that went on top of this? No. I think this was it. Now, I'd like to break in just for a second and give you guys a little update on what you're looking at. That's the, uh, they called it the submarine chamber. It was a, basically a hyperbaric system that was used to train uh, a very elite group of people to lock out of a United States Navy nuclear submarine with a nonchalant, non-military looking machine called the Beaver. And the Beaver Submersible uh, was actually a kind of a cover story. Uh, also, her other name was the Roughneck. She was supposed to be used for undersea oil exploration. And it uh, turns out that she was also uh, kind of a uh, uh, cover for a CIA program that they tested locking out divers out of the back of the Beaver Submersible uh, to extreme depths. And they were umbilical to the sub so they could do deep water work. Well, turns out that, uh, I think it was in 1979, the KGB, the, United, the Soviet Navy, pulled up their cables in the Black Sea that were the main communications to the, uh, the Soviet fleet, naval fleet from Moscow, and they found listening devices put on them. Turns out that the reason this chamber existed was to train divers to lock out of the nuclear sub into the Beaver the beaver was taken to her work site, which was in the Black Sea, and then they would deploy divers very close, or the, hover, the sub would hover over these listening cables and put listening devices, or the communication cables, and put listening devices on them. So this was a completely top secret program in plain sight. And this habitat, this uh, lockout chamber was the inspiration for Cameron uh, for the uh, movie, The Abyss, as an undersea oil exploration uh, drilling platform. So this uh, has a lot of fun history that a lot of people don't know about. You'll see the, if you want to read the whole story, there's a book out uh, written by a, a friend of mine, a mentor, uh, Will Foreman, called Blind Man's Bluff. So I encourage you to pick up Blind Man's Bluff, read some incredible stories about some heroes that still haven't been properly recognized. Dude, I'm tripping. Three minutes left on that battery. This was one of our first expeditions together with Undersea Voyager Project and Ocean Gate. And do you hear the comment, commentary in the back where we're talking about the batteries are only good for three minutes? Well, I told them I'll pre-dive the sub because I'm operating it. You back pre-dive it for me to make sure that you see what I did. But you guys are responsible for charging the batteries on the, the Blue View and in the uh, video tapes, uh, video cameras. Turns out they didn't check either. And we entered into two dives in a row with batteries that were not charged for the main reason we were being there, which was video. So once again, that shows that the culture at Ocean Gate was, was very flawed. <laughs> we well sit here for two minutes and squeeze it over. Mm -hmm. One of my friends came out to visit me with, so uh, since I was piloting such a beautiful machine, I uh, 
had my friend Eugene Roddenberry, uh, Rod Roddenberry from Star Trek fame, his father invented Star Trek. Uh, and um, through him, I've met some rather extraordinary people. Uh, but uh, he dove with me in uh, several different submersibles, including this one, and uh, actually took him down diving uh, at the mating grounds of the uh, angel sharks. So we were there at the exact right time. I knew where it was. That was one of our sites to dive. So uh, Eugene got to see something almost nobody has ever seen before, and that is angel sharks in the process of courting and mating. So he, he had a great dive. He had a lot of fun. Another friend of mine, Carl Stanley, you guys might know him. He, uh, he uh, built the um, uh, absolutely magnificent submarine called uh, Idabel Submersible. And it's in Roatan currently where he's doing tours, uh, diving down to as deep as 2,000 feet. And mind you, he, he built that submarine himself almost entirely, and uh, including all the welds. He trained himself how to be just as good as a nuclear certified welder. And uh, he did a magnificent job on the sub. He designed, but he did all of his design influence was done by the American Bureau of Shipping. And he used all the standard steels, all the standard welding techniques. He did everything and you can customize it like a recipe to make your own sub, which is what I did and what he did. But uh, his sub is substantially more capable than mine, but uh, I can put mine in tiny little locations and experience uh, areas that very few people can operate subs, but he can go to 2,000 feet so, and carry three people, uh, including himself, three total. So absolutely wonderful guy. I nicknamed him a mad scientist because his ideas are just uh, extraordinary, but they're all based in fact. He's a very, very good engineer and a very responsible man. And uh, now I understand he's like me. He's a pretty harsh critic of uh, Stockton Rush. So in this picture, here I am looking at those LED lights that shorted out and about ready to change them. And you notice there's two people in the picture. Well, I am not the one that caused the failure of the, uh, the program uh, in Catalina Island. Um, and it's funny, there were some strange relationships going on there. Uh, Stockton Rush inside the sub, once again, not in uh, earshot of me. And uh, out of that picture, there's another person, uh, maybe potentially on top of the submarine that did something rather extraordinary. I was asked by Stockton not to come and attend the seventh dive of our 60 dives planned because he had a fund, he had millionaires that were gonna be there and he was in a fundraising. He wanted to go diving off the Blue Ridge, which is really close to the Isthmus. And I said, I'd, I'd like to go, but he said, no, I, I really need all the room. And it's a simple dive. And I said, okay, this, just so you know, here's the uh, uh, checklist on the previous dive. I've already charged the batteries overnight. They're, they're vented, they're clean, they're secured, they're ready to go. So I handed the sub over, it's his sub, but I handed the sub over. I was supposed to be on every dive, but I went and had a meeting with the mayor in Avalon. And during my time, uh, a particular girl asked if she can uh, remove the vent caps to charge the batteries. And Guillermo uh, Solnine said, no, they've already been charged, you don't have to. For whatever reason, she did it anyway. She took off one of the vent caps, put it in her pocket and allowed the sub to be launched into the water like that. Um, there were some nefarious things going on, lots of rumors, but uh, some people have suggested there was a lover's quarrel and uh, there was, this was a spiteful action. I don't know. Um, like I said, that's just a rumor, but it seems to stick with lots of people that have told me that. So, and Guillermo and Stockton both pre-dove the sub and did not find that vent cap missing. And uh, it's a pretty obvious little item right there and it's on the checklist. Look and see both vent caps are in place. He didn't. And so they uh, dropped the sub in the water and predictably the flood, the, the battery pod flooded. It destroyed all 12 batteries inside their uh, lead acid batteries. And it also destroyed the battery management system and uh, some of the circuitry inside the sub is about $20,000, $25,000 fix, I think. Um, some people have said 12,000, some people have said 25. If I were to do it with my cost, it would be close to $25,000 to fix that up. And of course the entire expedition came to an abrupt end. Problem is that the starboard battery pod charging cap was removed by a trainee after they were told not to by Guillermo, but she took it off anyway and put it in her pocket and didn't tell anybody. Both Stockton and Guillermo missed it during a pre-dive. The battery pod flooded, causing an in-water emergency. And there was a premature end of the expedition. I was, that was the only dive I wasn't present for. 
And uh, being the figurehead of the expedition, Undersea Voyager Project and Ocean Gate, um, I wasn't there to defend myself. And I took the whole blame for the failure of the mission. And that, that haunted me for a long time. And um, I resented it. But um, oddly enough, Guillermo uh, uh, Stockton and I were still good friends. I, I love Stockton. I think the world of him. I'm really sad that he got himself hurt. But uh, there's a whole series of things to be talking about that. So, But after the failed expedition, uh, Ocean Gate fired nearly everybody that was employed by Ocean Gate except the girl that removed the vent cap. She was promoted and later went to work with National Geographic. Uh, so the corporate culture was unsafe and they were rewarding people based on favoritism. And so this was a sign of things to come, I'm afraid. So that brings me to the Titan. Well, I wasn't involved with the designing of Titan. I never would have gone along with any of it. Um, and uh, what actually happened there was a pretty interesting series of events um, and their opinions. These are my opinions. You have to say that so you don't get sued, right? Um, anybody that knows oceanic hydrodynamic forces and engineering know that one of the worst hulls you can build is out of carbon fiber. If it's not a boat where it's subjected only to ambient surface pressures, you don't build a carbon fiber hull. It's not in the American Bureau of Shipping other than a cautionary note, don't use it. So he wanted to be you know, unique and maverick, and uh, so he built one anyway. And every time you take a uh, carbon fiber hull, which does not bend and flex like metal, it's very stiff, it's fantastic for expansive forces. That's why we use it on scuba tanks and firefighters use uh, carbon fiber tanks all the time. Aviation uses carbon fiber tanks for oxygen, but they're really not very good for compressive forces. In fact, imagine if you take a carbon fiber tube and you start squeezing it with enough pressure, you're gonna to start to hear that cracking. Well, that cracking that you hear are micro fractures that do not recover like the, flexing, the flexion of steel or, or titanium. Uh, or even aluminum for that matter. So it's going to, every time you hear a crackle, it's a failure. And the next time you dive it, it fractures and fails a little bit more. So it weakens with every pressure cycle. So, and also they had titanium spheres, uh, which the uh, cylinder of carbon fiber were glued into with epoxy. Well, they're all dissimilar. You have three dissimilar materials there and they all have different expansion coefficients. So even a first semester engineer would say those are bad combination, especially under compressive forces. So it was an obvious elementary no-no, but Stockton went forward with it, trying to be the Maverick engineer and show all of us that we're wrong. With every pressure cycle, you're gonna loosen and fracture that epoxy that was sealing the whole thing together Plus, you're going to have all these micro failures because, you know, he, he had the uh, pressure hole wrapped uh, with over a mandrel of steel uh, that was not done in a, uh, a vacuum environment or even a clean room for that matter. So dust and air micro air bubbles were inside all through that hull. It was not homogeneous. It was very, um, very uh, uh, contaminated hull. And so all these micro pressure, uh, micro spheres of air trapped inside the hull all would collapse and cause some of that crunching you would hear. So it was just bad on top of bad. And so it was a bad Cavalier, but it was like, I'm gonna do it in defiance, which is a bad reason to engineer a submarine that people's lives depend on. But once again, I revert back to that unsafe culture that I saw when I was working with Catalina with them. So what you're about to see, if you're squeamish, you may not wanna watch it, but this is what happens to human body when 160 tons of pressure, which is what they endured with the fracture of the collapse, the implosion of the hull. And so I want you to, I want to point out 160 tons is a lot of pressure to be on side of uh, one person. And there were five people on board and the pressure hull, once a carbon fiber hull fractures with an implosion, it shatters into razor sharp shards that are elongated or razor shaped uh, or combinations of both. They, they fracture in the worst razor sharp things you can think of and they're all forced in at an extreme pressure. So this kind of gives you an idea of what these poor souls endured.
this is absolutely an amazing series of numbers right here. I'd like to take a moment and talk to you about the implosion duration was between um, between 15 and 20 milliseconds. And milliseconds, obviously, they're ex extraordinary short period of time. It takes the human brain about 120 to 150 milliseconds to actually have a pain response. Um, to conceive something in your brain that something is happening takes also about 75 milliseconds to even begin the concept that something is starting to happen. Um, so this was beyond their ability to even know that there was a problem. And the air inside being compressed that rapidly um, caused what we call an adiabatic compression. Any saturation diver, commercial diver knows exactly what this is. And this is when you super compress air or any other gas, um, you get an incredible friction. We all know about Charles Law. And as you compress air, it heats up. That's why your scuba tanks heat up when they're being filled. Well, the adiabatic compression gets to a point where it ignites into a hydrogen steam explosion, including the air, air uh, voids inside the human body in the ear, throat, lungs, intestinal tract, gut. All of these have air. Even little oxygen or air bubbles that could be inside your blood if it ever gets a bubble nuclei effect and you have bubbles. These are also subject to the same thing. So you would basically compress the human body with, like I said, 160 tons um, of pressure. And that gas inside you would compress to a point where it literally suffers adiabatic compression and explodes. So they imploded, exploded with up, some people have estimated up to 2000 degrees of heat. Some people have said it was only about 450 degrees of heat, but I think anybody, human body inside 450 degrees is gonna get a major sunburn. So, this is equivalent to roughly 220 pounds of expl TNT explosives inside the sub to blow it up. So that gives you an idea of these incredible numbers we're about to see. What you're about to see is the actual speed of the implosion. Let's watch it again. Do you guys see the light coming from the center of the pressure hole inside? That is the adiabatic compression reaching uh, critical to where you get a steam explosion. So you're undergoing the rapid compression, which is extraordinarily deadly, um, but you're also going through the explosion almost simultaneously. The forces are fighting each other. It's really unhealthy. So you can pretty well see that it was uh, instantaneous, incredible uh, violence of action. And, um, you know, if there's one, if there's a way to go, that's definitely, you know, a relatively painless way. Um, but there was a uh, transcript that's been intercepted. I'm still trying to find out if it was true, but it's being carefully guarded. But the polar print, there was a, there was a transition, um, transmission between the sub and the polar prints that seems to suggest very, very strongly that they descended much faster than normal. What causes a submarine to descend faster than it's supposed to? Well, if you're um, a little cavalier on the safety and you don't weight the sub properly and you put a whole bunch of people inside of a submarine without 
you know, taking off ballast weights. Um, when you close the hatch and blow the ballast, now you got a sub that's too heavy and it'll fall faster. Another way to, uh, of course, that would be a safety uh, violation. Uh, but the Titan also had oil compensated lead acid batteries. And if a vent cap was left off, a vent when they charge these uh, lead acid batteries inside the oil compensated battery pods, you still have to remove the vent cap to let the hydrogen escape. You don't want to keep that hydrogen around a spark. Uh, so you still have to vent the cap, uh, vent the, uh, the fluid, uh, the hydrogen out of the fluid. So if somebody left that off and they launched the sub, then oil would be displaced by the seawater ingressing into it. And the seawater is substantially heavier than the lighter oil. And now the sub becomes potentially as much as 150 pounds heavier than it should have been. Uh, which would create a rapid descent. Now, a rapid descent on the carbon fiber would only increase the odds of it imploding at a shallower depth. Rapid onset rather than being very careful and very, you know, very slow. So it would be kind of odd if the Titan implosion happened because of a missing vent cap. That, uh, that would be very foretelling as to what happened to us during our expedition. But honestly, the Titan imploded due to hubris, poor design, improper building materials and an unsafe culture. So I guess the bottom line is that here in the submersible industry, I've been diving for you know subs for over 30 years. So they've had over 60 years of a really, really safe uh, environment, no implosions, but we now have our first implosion. Uh, and it was somebody who was told time and time again by lots of leaders in our industry, Stockton, please rethink this. This is not a good material to use. Um, so he will be remembered in the history books. The problem is, I don't think he's going to be remembered the way he intended. So that, that gives you my two cents on uh, my opinions on uh, Ocean Gate. And uh, I miss Stockton. I wish you were alive and healthy. Uh, I, wish that, I wish that 19 year old boy were alive and healthy. And um, it, was, uh, it was really sad to see the, the loss of innocent lives on that. It's a good example of what not to do. And that's, that's what the history books will show. But we have ourselves a little submersible that we've uh, brought to Florida. Uh, last year, and we started to develop a lionfish hunting program, and I want to share it with you guys, and I sure would love any input on it, but another uh, subheading with this would be how to lose your life savings in three easy steps. But here's a brief history of our little submarine. Uh, it was, our hull was originally a Kittredge uh, designed by Captain George Kittredge, uh, a naval uh, submersible commander, submarine commander, excuse me, uh, in, in my opinion, a Cold War hero, a magnificent man. He designed and built the K-250 uh, and a whole bunch of them. I think he built 47 of them. He wanted to have a submarine in every garage, which I, I actually kind of uh, think that is true as well for anybody with self-discipline. Uh, but our hull was built in 1971. And here's a fun picture, camel cigarette ad, and there's a yellow submarine dangling in the background there. But I just thought I'd point something out real quick. You see, there's a sonar locator dome on the front of that sub. And of course, they're all looking at the scallop for dinner. But I was looking at the sonar dome because the sub that I found rotting in somebody's backyard had a sonar locator on it. And I was like, oh, my God, I actually am going to buy the Camel submarine. Uh, so I'm, I actually have a famous submarine. Um, but uh, this guy, uh, this uh, doctor was using the submarine to locate a uh, drug uh, dealer's aircraft that was off of uh, Point Loma that was carrying a, uh, the DEA said it was carrying a bag full of money. So he bought the submarine to go hunt and find it down. And it took him a year or so. And uh, he did eventually find it, but it was right off the sewer alt fall of Point Loma. And all of the sewage had draped over the submarine of the uh, aircraft that had crashed and had rotted away everything except the aluminum. So every fabric, every dollar bill, everything that was inside that submarine, the seats, they were all rotted away. So, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars were, uh, were lost to the sea and to poop. 
but it was a rust bucket and uh, I had it shipped out to Maryland and uh, a magnificent welder uh, who used to weld uh, nuclear powered submarine hulls, uh, Daniel Lance, did all the repairs to it. Not only did he weld magnificent uh, repairs all over the sub, he also x-rayed every weld on the sub to verify that it was void free and good for the full depth of the sub. So we actually had the sub custom made with all the weld, uh, welded in all the things that I needed to operate the sub the way I was hoping. And uh, when it was all done, it was just basically a new submarine for the pressure hull, according to American Bureau of Shipping Standards. Again, PVHO, Pressure Vessels for Human Occupancy subject. So she was a magnificent little sub. Uh, she, her crush depth is 880 feet. And uh, so it's called a K250 because she can operate to 500 feet, but with a safety factor of 100%, we always, she, uh, Captain Kittred said it's a 250 foot sub. Well, the limiting factor was the front port, which was only half inch thick. And uh, I replaced it with a two inch thick uh, uh, front port, which had an implosion rate of about 890 feet. So at 250, 300 feet deep, it's extraordinarily safe machine. There's the new thicker uh, acrylic on the dome and a thicker acrylic on the front port and uh, these wonderful side ports there that are uh, three inches thick. So she was easily diveable to 500 feet, but I still restrict her to 300 feet because deeper than that, people can't rescue you. <laughs> so I put the inflatable bags on the side of her just like I uh, had on the uh, side of the sea imagine submarines because when they're empty uh, and you're doing your dives, they, they attach to the top of the uh, cylinder and allow water to pass through it. So you have less drag than with a hard ballast tank. So I thought that was a fun idea and did it. And uh, she was just a wonderful machine painted in blue shark blue, which was my favorite color. And, uh, but her namesake was uh, my friend who got me into submarines in the first place, Ralph White, who filmed the Titanic uh, for James Cameron for the, for the film Titanic. And uh, his nickname was the Great White. So when he passed away and I, I got possession of the sub, I, I named the sub the Great White in honor of him. But he always told me that when you become a submersible pilot, always, always have your deep diving submersibles on your feet because your toes will get cold. So on the first dive of the sub, I took my brother's ashes and uh, the deep diving submersibles and uh, did the maiden dive on the sub. And she just performed like a dream. She's just a sweet machine. Everything about her was American Bureau of Shipping Standards to, uh, uh, correct. And uh, she just turned out to be a little Tonka truck. I did all kinds of dives with her. Uh, all through Lake Tahoe and Fallen Leaf Lake and even offshore in, in California, uh, off the Pacific. And uh, she just was a wonderful workhorse. Um, and uh, I got so happy with her performance. She was so easy to dive and so forgiving. I started training other people how to pilot the sub. And uh, I'd take them at the docks and I'd throw them inside, I'd show them all the systems, and then tethered to the uh, shore, uh, to the dock, and with communications and a uh, scuba tank available so I could go down there and fill the sub manually and bring the, the student back up. I trained about 100 people, I think, how to dive the sub like that. Just had a wonderful time. And the more I shared the sub, the happier I was. But then in 2012, I got offered an opportunity to take her to Malaysia and do a media project looking at coral reef decline and pollution. And I, again, it took me about two milliseconds to say, yeah, I'd like to do that. Problem is, is that she wasn't built for open sea, uh, even in calm water. So we had to make sure that she was tougher and expand her uh, harness, uh, electrical harness, so she could adapt to more systems, including more lights, bigger thrusters. And I wanted a flat deck, that way you, you protect the hull of the sub better uh, about banging into docks and stuff if you have a flat deck around it, because it transitions the energy away from the hull of the deck, uh, the hull. And so my inspiration, once again, was uh, Ralph White was uh, telling me about the submarine using the abyss watched the movie The Abyss, fell in love with the sub, talked to Phil Newton, who built that submarine, and uh, he was telling me that he absolutely loved the flat deck idea. I thought it was great. So I adapted that into the design of my sub. You can see a nice little flat deck right there. And uh, Part of that, of course, was for diver support so they could hang on the outside of it, um, but also just for loading equipment and, and having that uh, safety around the pressure hole so that it would take the impact before the hole. And so after five long months of building and designing and, and redesigning and rebuilding, we got her all set up. And so we did our test dives and she just was a dream. Just 
better than ever and uh, rock solid and uh, just a magnificent calm water diving sub. And uh, I have over to 500 feet uh, in that uh, condition. And uh, she's just been an absolute dream. So here's a little video of what it was like to go through the process. I see a lot of the people in the sub are teenagers. She's an ambassador program. I love teenagers. I was uh, getting excited about engineering. Right? Just, uh, not really, he's the engineer. He helps me do a lot of the work on the sub. Great stuff. took this up to the Maker Fair, and uh, we got a lot of attention, but oddly enough, the Mythbusters came by from TV fame, and they were the judges, and they gave us the uh, editor's choice pick, and we won first place in the fair, because the, they thought the sub was so well designed. I've been honored. Everywhere the sub goes, it draws a crowd. Only the super high-tech transportation system for the submarine in, in Malaysia. It was a, a wooden barge took us across some pretty heavy seas and I was afraid it's gonna roll over. Uh, Scott uh, was the custodian of the transfer and he, he was scared for his life a couple of times. It was a 2,000 pound crane lifted a 3,000 pound sub, that was fun. But once we got through checking the whole systems on the sub, she was ready to dive. And uh, we took 33 journalists underwater to uh, look at the condition of the corals down to a depth, I think the deepest depth is only 116 feet. But um, some of the people that dove in the submarine with us were the first people in their country's history to dive in the sub. I'm <laughs> 
After we were done with our dives, uh, we were taken to uh, Manila and they put us in the <coughs> middle of a mall <laughs> and I uh, gave a bunch of lectures there about the ocean's condition to uh, people from all over Asia came to the talks. It was really quite a privilege. And then we popped her back in a container and brought her back to the United States. Uh, but you can see right here, we, we, can, we got wheels on the submarine because we can lower it off of our uh, trailer that I built that... Uh, is especially made to roll the sub off and transport her across country. Um, but the nice thing about it is we have been able to launch the submarine in places about the same width that you would launch um, a canoe. Um, so we've been able to operate in high altitude lakes and tiny coves uh, where you never could have gotten a bigger submarine, which is why the sub is the size it is, so specifically for transporting it into difficult locations. Part of the mission of the sub was to support divers. Um, so um, there's four white tanks on the back of the deck and two of them were 150 foot cubic foot uh, bottles for divers. And there were 25 foot umbilicals stored below decks with regulators on them. So diver can just swim over and grab it and breathe on it. And uh, so they got a whole bunch more air available to them uh, than what's on their back. They just use what's on their back to get down to the sub and, and to get back to the surface. We also did some underwater archaeological surveys up Catalina Islands, and uh, we dove as deep as 300 feet. And uh, the scientist, the archaeologist that was with me, hired us to go out uh, to look for Paleolithic shoreline, looking for ancient man fire rings. Well, I'm an ocean guy, and I know about sand drift. And I thought, well, with the tons of sand that can be moved every day in a storm, you're probably not going to find any any uh, man-made artifacts at 300 feet uh, off of Catalina Island or uh, Channel Islands, <laughs> uh, we did. We found a fire ring. The archeologist estimated it was about 12,000 years old by, by the pictures and video that we took of it. Uh, so I was completely wrong. <laughs> he actually did find evidence of ancient man 300 feet deep off the Catalina uh, Channel Islands, uh, which I found to be quite extraordinary. And I ate crow on that dive. Here's another little mission we did uh, with the submarine in Alpine Lakes around ancient trees I was telling you about. We dove as deep as, or I dove as deep as 300 feet uh, in the lake looking for stuff uh, pretty much to the bottom and uh, found 88 trees. I don't know how I was able to work in such terrible conditions. So I brought the sub to Florida um, last year and met up with uh, Scott Ganello from uh, Lionfish Central. And with him, we, uh, we factored out the, the particular thing that he did, which was patrolling, you know, looking for lionfish to cull and capture. Uh, so that's the division that I'm working with him under. The concept, of course, is to modify the submarine to operate for long open ocean toes in bad weather and operate down to depths of 300 feet with a spearing system on the front of the sub and a collection system on the back of the sub. But uh, she wasn't really made to do open ocean sub toes, so we stripped her naked again. There, This is the great white after hours. And uh, we put these uh, long aluminum pontoons, 12 feet long, on either side of the sub, specifically to make her super stable for the surface. And uh, we had the little bows put on the front right there so that she would ride down the trough of a wave 
capture the, the front of the face of the oncoming wave and angle up over it instead of plunging right through the waves like she used to with the old configuration. And uh, boy, did it work out just as designed. It worked out wonderfully. And uh, once again, the design parameters and the materials are according to American Bureau of Shipping Standards. Again, I'm not doing anything new other than the application of already tried and true technology. And uh, uh, here we are in the back of uh, the hammerhead, uh, uh, you know, going out there with um, our, our beautiful uh, little submarine in tow of this beautiful hammerhead uh, submarine. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, it was absolutely wonderful to tow her out in open sea and watch her tow so clean and perfect, better than ever. And uh, the pontoons give her a very unique look, but they uh, also provide a little more protection for the sub from uh, banging into boats and docks. So it actually doubles as a, as a front and back bumper. Um, but as you can see on the surface, she just uh, is nice and flat and stable. When you blow ballast, she often goes down nose first. Um, it's a bias that because the pontoons are longer in the front, so they're slightly heavier. And there's four valves on the pontoons, two per valve, uh, two valves per pontoon. So no matter what orientation you're at, you can vent all the air out. <clears throat> and underwater, she's just as stable and as wonderful as ever. So there's a nice little picture from an ROV. <laughs> but uh, there's a uh, Scott Ganello diving outside as a uh, as, uh, as well as our, our beloved Lisa from the museum. She was also there. Matter of fact, she took that picture. And she took that picture too, a very happy, uh, tired old Scott and a very vibrant Scott who's actually the same age as me. I hate him because he hasn't gone gray yet. But uh, anyway, there's a forward looking shot of the sub in her natural environment. Again, my office. And there's uh, Scott giving me the, uh, the uh, the, the close-up shot uh, the, with a highly professional, highly expensive GoPro camera for National Geographic. Um, but uh, the, the images that uh, Scott and Lisa got were just wonderful. You'll see a lot of those here in a minute. And of course, you might recognize somebody standing right next to me there is our beautiful Lisa. And you got Scott Ganello, and you got uh, old Mr. Hammerhead himself right there, who's the patron of that whole dive expedition. Uh, thank you very much, buddy. I appreciate it. I understand you're in the audience. I talked to you earlier. So I, I just want to say thank you very much, Mr. Hazel Baker, for making that whole series of events possible. It was, it was so much fun. And we proved the concept there. And uh, we just got annihilated by a squall. As you can see, we're soaked like rats. But it was, uh, it was tons of fun. So this is uh, Dola, a sweetheart from uh, Qatar, who I wish for my daughter. I just love her to bits. She's She's just a sweetheart and she's hopefully uh, gonna help us uh, market the sub and the uh, different programs with the sub when we bring her back to Florida. So uh, we have future uh, hopes of working with Dola. And uh, right before I left uh, for my, uh, my, uh, my medical evaluations and stuff, we did a class right there in Florida, uh, March 16th through the 20th and uh, actually celebrated my birthday doing a class. And we were pretty well filled with uh, students who learned how to pilot the sub in the bay right out there at sea camp. And uh, Lisa was one of our students. And uh, of course, she excels at everything she does. And she excelled in this and just had a, had a lot of fun. Uh, there's Scott, Ganello, Dola, and myself. And Dola it was nice enough to develop our new patch, which is... Uh, I'm going to be printing those up pretty soon for everybody who dives with us is qualified to be wearing that patch only for the first two years of operation till we have 500 dives uh, because after 500 dives, you're no longer a test pilot, you're crew and we'll change the patch at that time. Here's a short video of our dive and I want you to please think of my frame of mind during this uh, series of dives. Imagine there's a spear system on the front of the sub. There's two lasers where the two lasers intersect in front of the forward looking viewport. That's where the spear will be and when you activate the trigger to spear a lionfish. So how can you operate the sub hunting lionfish? And with that frame of that reference, of course we're cruising and checking stability right now and sub is just perfect with the pontoons. I painted her yellow so she doesn't look the same color as a red and blue slalom buoy. A lot of speed boaters were coming at me with that color, so I'm hoping yellow is a better color. 
Now you notice the bow of the sub is slightly down. Well, that's because I have mounted the vertical thruster from the central sides to one thruster in the very back of the sub. The reason I did that is I still use it for vertical thrust up and down, but I can also use it to tip the sub nose down to help aim the spear before I activate it to spear the lionfish. And the accuracy and the maneuverability was much better than I anticipated. It's just magnificent little sub now. And you see all that back real estate on the back of the submarine? That's where I'm gonna build the collection cage for all the lionfish that we collect. Right there is the front area where we're gonna have the spear and it's gonna activate right in front of the front port. So we'll spear the fish, scrape it off, and it'll go through a tube all the way down the side of the sub with thrusters inside of it to push the fish into the awaiting cages. So there's lots of real estate to put these systems on board. And we're in the process of building our prototype spear system right now um, with a friend of mine named Jim Etherington is doing the work. So now if you look down in front of the sub, there's a barrel sponge. That barrel sponge is where I'm imagining there's a lionfish and I'm gonna to try to orient the sub to spear it. And so you can see I'm, I'm descending down a little bit closer. I'm pretending that this fish is moving around. So I'm trying to keep him in the framework of where the spear will hit. And it turns out the sub was ex just like it was made for this. With the thruster in the back, you can see operating. I'm pushing the sub down, which when you push down with force, the stern will drop. And as it pushes closer to the ground, I reverse the thruster. And now all of a sudden it goes bow down so I can aim the spear perfectly. I, I'm just so thrilled, it's so accurate. I'm adjusting to where the lionfish would be. Gentle inputs forward and back. And then I hit the thruster to push me down closer to the fish. I hit it reverse, I go really, really bow down and I fire the weapon. And it was just, it was very, inst very instinctive. I can teach anybody to do this in probably half a day. So it turns out that the test was very successful. Again, Mr. Hazelbaker, thank you very much for offering this opportunity to prove it. But you can see how downslope the nose is. And now with downslope nose, I hit the reverse on the thrusters and it pulls me up and away from the coral. Not once did I touch any coral. Uh, so not only is it a pretty effective fishing system down deep for lionfish, it is very nimble submarine and very easy to avoid hitting the coral. So it's uh, keeping the safety of the coral in mind. Uh, everything worked. Now there's a program in Bermuda uh, that operates with this uh, custom built ROV that they invented with a spearing system. And you can see right now it's speared one of the lionfish and it draws it into a special scraping system that deposits inside that white little mesh system, that, that cage inside. And it's very effective actually, it does a really good job. And I think they can operate down to a 600 feet but I think the rental on this thing is um, I think $12,000 a month. Uh, so it's, it's gonna be very expensive for somebody who's gonna try to seek a profit with this. And they, um, they declined to work with this because they're trying to build up their own brand and their own product, which I totally understand. But we're building a spear system on the front of our submarine that's not exactly like that, but it's kind of inspired by that. And, and uh, we're custom building the prototype right now, should be done within a month or so. And we'll test it uh, with in Lake Tahoe here in California. Uh, we'll be tying uh, potatoes to uh, five pound weights with monofilament line, and I'll be uh, I'll be spearing potatoes uh, to make sure the system works reliably. Uh, so I'll film that and update uh, Lisa so she can put that on the site. But uh, it's coming by pretty soon. So the location of the spearing gun uh, and, and recovery system is right there in the front and uh, have about seven feet of space, goes all the way up to in front of the, the dome port and all the way down in front of the front flat port. So there's quite a bit of room to put it. And on the back deck, that's where we're gonna be putting the storage system for the lionfish, all connected with uh, slick tubing. And every cage will have its handle on it so you can surface the submarine next to the boat 
they can just reach down and pull the uh, little cage out full of lionfish, hopefully, or use a little davit. But uh, the bottom line is to keep them safe from being spined and to capture as many as 300 fish per dive is the capability of space. I don't know if it's gonna be that efficient or if I'm diving in areas where there even is a single fish or if I dive in a wreck where there's a thousand, who knows what I'll get, but you know, some days will be higher than others. But the system works, the system is ready for prototyping. Hopefully we're gonna be in the, the ability to do that very soon. Um, I exhausted my life savings to do this uh, testing in Florida last year. And I'm hoping that we can uh, fundraise a little bit of money uh, to help us out with this next generation that we will hopefully we'll bring in the sub down there, maybe just after Christmas sometime. And we'll be testing her for a couple of months. If the system all works and hopefully we get a little help with uh, donations and sponsors to, to help make this a reality, um, I want to develop the spear system and the capture system so that it's easy to replicate. And I'm going to open source that so anybody that wants to build our design can, and uh, they can put it on their personal ROV, or what I'm, I'm, uh, I'm personally hoping is that they wanna build a submarine and do the same thing I'm gonna be doing. So they have a lionfish hunting submarine. And at uh, $7 a pound per fish, um, if you get uh, between 25 and 50 fish three or four days a week, you're in the $100,000 income bracket. If you can get 25 to 75 fish, uh, to 100 fish, you're in the $250,000 income bracket. So it is it is a potentially profitable endeavor. And I'm hoping disabled vets, uh, veterans, uh, and anybody who wants to do something really, really cool, the submarine and healthy environment will jump on board too and maybe enter the submersible community. I'll even uh, help them uh, as a big brother looking over their shoulder and helping guide them through the American Bureau of Shipping Standards to build their own sub. Uh, so they do it right down to an operational depth of two, 300 feet. And if somebody wants to go all crazy, like I do, uh, you might build a sub that's capable of a thousand feet, which I'm contemplating. So, um, and put a big dent in the lionfish problem by doing something really cool in the meantime and dragging the media in with you, because you got to admit everywhere a submarine goes, it draws a crowd. News likes to cover the sub. If you Google me, uh, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff with submarines. Everywhere I go with a submarine, everybody pays attention. And it's not because I have a draw. Submarines are cool and I'm a nerd. So guys, <laughs> thank you very much for having me tonight. And uh, I guess Lisa and I will field some questions. And if anybody wants to give me tons and tons of money to bring the sub back and do this, I'm all ears and your best friend. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. We greatly appreciate it. Um, actually, as a thank you, we also g give you a one-year membership. So when you come down to Florida, you can come into the museum 362 days a year <laughs> um, <laughs> and wow. explore through the exhibit. So if anybody um, has any questions, go ahead and put them in the, in the chat box. We also have a couple people, Chris, I see you, you can unmute for you guys. I have a couple board members who are here in, in the library and um, there we go. There's- Well, usually when questions? I walk into a, well, yeah, usually when I walk into a place as nice as the museum, people call security and have me escorted out. So this will be nice to be welcomed to some <laughs> place that nice. <laughs> Well, All I right. liked your uh, remarks about the, uh, I'm going to have to step out or we'll be echoing with each other. <laughs> I liked your remarks about the animals. Uh, oh, and I like that you, you in particular like the squid. Um, I haven't seen many people that that's one of their favorite animals, but even going after the poachers, um, really neat stuff. But um, one of the things that Dr. Rush talked about was that the acrylic would kind of give you a warning um, and then people said that probably can't, truly can't be true, especially at that depth. Um, is there any truth to that, that they get any warning? Oh, yeah, there's lots of truth to that in shallower water. Um, with the pressures that he was at, uh, the, the, your warning would be substantially less than, I mean, um, my, uh, my friend out in Roatan diving the Idabel, um, Carl Stanley, he says that uh, you can actually see the change of the clarity and the deformation 
uh, of the acrylic. And he knows when to change it out because it slowly starts to contort over time. And so he just changes out the acrylic whenever it, it fails inspection. Uh, but that's at 2,000 feet, not 12,000 feet. And uh, just a footnote on that, uh, the acrylic that was used on the Titan was rated by the manufacturer at 1,300 meters, which means that the manufacturer said, never go deeper than 2,600 meters with that acrylic or it will fail. And Stockton was taking it down to 4,000 meters with lives on board. So I don't, I, I would not consider that a, uh, a mature thing to do. So I'm not in agreement with that, but yeah, it will contort, but it'll contort at 12,000 feet a lot faster than it will at 2,000 feet, so. So Scott, I question? have a thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Scott, I have a question on the trees. I think you had told me at one point they also found parts of a beetle or a bug from that time frame as well. Yeah, they How yeah, we did. Was that? Um, well, I I took a core sampling system, which is an 18-inch drill, which is hollow, and it's held by an air drill that I I plumbed into the sub so that it's just like a drill that you use for, you know, air driven drill. It's the same thing. And um, I fill it full of uh, vegetable oil instead of, you know, uh, petroleum oil. So it's not bad for the lake. And I set it up, I, I clamped it in place and I set it up with a, a scuba tank uh, on the outside that uh, the pressure went from the scuba tank into the submarine through a valve back out to the submarine to the drill. So I could operate it from inside by opening and closing this air valve, which was, uh, it worked pretty well, but I was only at 200 feet. So, um, but the drill would, tr would uh, RPM about 3000 RPM. So it would just burrow into the soft water soaked tree. And one time I, uh, I, I trapped myself, uh, it wouldn't come back out. <laughs> so I was taking the submarine going up and down and left and right up and down until finally it broke free and came back out. But a lot of these trees as ancient as they are still have bark. And when they looked at it at University of Nevada, they 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 set it on the table and the bark fell off and they see this little black thing and they looked at it under a microscope and go oh my god that's a beetle's leg and so i drilled through a poor little dead beetle i didn't feel it but uh i uh, actually had a four thousand year old beetle's leg that i recovered under the bark wow. of course it was skill i, I meant to do that wow that, that's <laughs> just incredible and because it's fresh water, it preserves and it's deep and it's cold, correct? Yeah, it's deep, cold and very low oxygen. Um, even the crawdads are walking around uh, like they're high. Uh, they're, they're really slow and they don't really have a sense of direction. So they're very low oxygen. So they're walking around all, you know, lethargic, but they're, uh, they're all over the place on the bottom. But yeah, the, the trees are perfectly preserved. And I mean that, I truly mean that. When we brought up the the core samples of the trees for carbon dating and we peeled it out you, we could smell the pine wow it was just amazing it was just amazing all right well i don't know i know that uh we're getting some messages that people are having to sign off i do have but, a question okay. um i know okay Okay. Um, so my question was, um, so I know with the Trieste, which went down to the Marianas Trench for the first time, uh, when they were descending, they had that, that one viewport actually crack and the, <laughs> and the whole submarine, you know, rock. So I guess my question would be, uh, can you explain like what happened with that dive and why the pilots were safe in that scenario and how kind well, of like yeah. that was allowed to happen? Well, uh, Dr. Andy Recknitzer was in charge of that whole program with the Office of Naval Research, and he introduced me to John Walsh, and we later became good friends. He's a sweet man and absolutely one of my heroes and mentors. And uh, Don was telling me about that exact moment, which <laughs> he, I'm not going to repeat what he told you, uh, me, uh, but uh, he was a little alarmed. Let's just put it at that. Uh, <laughs> but him and uh, 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 Jacques Picard uh, both heard that, and they, they figured, okay, that's it, but hold on. We heard it, we thought about it, we registered it. So obviously we're still here. It wasn't catastrophic, what was it? Well, it was the transition tube from the top of the Trieste down through a, a steel pipe to the opening hatch of the bathyscaphe sphere itself, which was made out of titanium. 
and they entered into it and closed this incredible hatch. Uh, still a, an engineering marvel, that hatch is just beautiful and sealed it all up. But there's a splash hatch on the top of that, uh, that um, conning tower. And in that is a porthole of acrylic. So they could see their distance from small boats and, and so they could operate the trest a little bit on the surface to avoid collision. Well, that's what ruptured and it ruptured at roughly, I think, uh, 12,000 feet. <laughs> so it held its own for a long time, but they found out that it, the acrylic itself didn't crack. The acrylic held up. It was the steel pipe that co contorted and allowed that to slip in under water pressure. And it impacted the other side of the conning tower so much, it made a three inch deformation in the steel. And then of course it all flooded with water. Um, and uh, the uh, tree has started to fall a little bit faster because it had 600 extra pounds of water. So fascinating story. So, well, bless you. I miss you and big hugs and thanks again. All right. Good night.